on the trail of those few people who shape our lives to discover the true nature of modern power and influence. Tonight, I'm investigating the world of computing. I've chosen two giants of the computing world. They were both born in the same year, 1955. I've chosen Steve Jobs, who gave us the PC, and Bill Gates, whose software runs on millions of computers around the world. They are the founders and leaders of companies whose logos we all recognize, Microsoft and Apple, businesses whose combined value is over $290 billion. Their influence is global and affects every aspect of our daily lives. The best thing is at the end of the program, I get to decide which one of them is the world's most powerful person in computing. did these two men get their power from? And when did it become clear to those around them that they were set for greatness? I'm off to the west coast of the U.S. to find out. Here in the mountains above Silicon Valley, I've come to meet Dan Kotke, one of Steve Jobs' best friends in college, to go back to those forgotten days before the personal computer. I first met Steve my first month of uh, college as a freshman at Reed College. Did you become instant friends? Um, not quite. We uh, bonded over our mutual interest in Eastern literature and philosophy. There was Be Here Now, Autobiography of a Yogi, Cosmic Consciousness by Buck, you know, Ramakrishna. I read books. Yeah. Was Steve into that too at the oh, time? Oh, yeah, very much so. Steve and I used to hitchhike to the Hare Krishna temple on Sunday nights for the love feast. No. Yeah. Did he have long hair and all that sort of uh, stuff? Oh, well, yeah, everybody had long hair. Yes, for the love and, feast. Yeah. Amazing. And well, what well, the main attraction was it was free. <laughs> <laughs> Steve had not yet found his passion. Instead, he dropped out of university and with Dan, traveled around India for six months. What were the personal characteristics that made you think he would end up where he is today? Uh, I didn't. I didn't think that. I don't know. I don't think anybody could have. The Steve that I knew when we were in India, I, I did not see that Im ambition at all. But what you can say for sure is that Steve is uh, an independent thinker. He was always looking for people who were unconventional and free thinkers like himself. A very early trick that Steve used to use was just, you know, putting his bare feet up on the conference table when he was interviewing people just to see what, how they would react. Did Steve change once he began to make tens of millions of dollars? No, what changed Steve was the, uh, the vision and the zeal of changing the world with computers, and that's a good thing. You know, Steve is actually remarkably unaffected by his wealth, I would say. According to Dan, Steve was a pretty cosmic guy, and still is. But his potential to be the most powerful computer mogul was far from obvious. But what about Bill? Did he show early signs of the ability and attitude to get ahead? 400 miles away at Lakeside, a private school in Seattle, I might discover more. I'm off to meet Bill Gates' math teacher to see if he recognized any of the traits that marked Bill for such phenomenal achievement. As his teacher, what were the three personality traits that you observed in Bill Gates that are reflected in his current success? Well, I think the first was his incredible curiosity. He was really curious about anything to do with computers. The second would be his tenacity in trying to solve a problem or figure out how to work through a problem. And I guess the, the third would be his just desire to be 
intellectually on top of whatever it was that he was working with and really put it in perspective. What kind of student was he? As a computer student, he always found the quickest ways to write a little program that would work or do this or do that or the other thing. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, we would go, the teachers would go to Bill and his cohorts to learn things if we didn't understand how to do them ourselves. <laughs> I love that. The teachers would go to the student to learn. At age 15, Bill and a friend set up a company called Trafodata, charging companies to analyze traffic information. They took the tapes that come from those little rubber tubes that do the traffic uh, counts, and they analyzed those for, the, for these different companies that were doing traffic studies. This is amazing. And there were students doing this. Yes, they were doing it. They were very capable. But this, this indicates a strong entrepreneurial spirit, even when they were young. Yeah, and I think, I think you could tell Bill was going to be a good businessman when they started working on contract issues, and if they had any little disputes with the company, they, they would really hammer it out and make sure that it, it worked right. As far as the early days are concerned, Bill Gates is off to a great start. He is already writing software in school and showing the entrepreneurial flair that will score big for him later in life. For me, Bill is ahead at this stage. But let's see what happens when these two really get on the road to power. This is one of Steve Jobs' oldest friends, nicknamed Waz. I'm hoping Waz can reveal how a directionless hippie like Steve Jobs kick-started the computer revolution and how Waz created the first personal computer that was to give Steve Jobs his power. It all happened in the mid-70s when Wozniak and Jobs started to attend a computer club called Homebrew, where enthusiasts were exchanging ideas about building computers. What Jobs saw at the club was to change his life forever. Every two weeks on a Wednesday night was the most important day of my life, and I would sit here in this auditorium. And we had different parts where people offered things and asked for things, and later on parts where you could get together and meet people and talk and share things and have demos. And these meetings were all the rumors about new chips and what people were saying. And we always spoke like it's going to be a revolution. And the big companies were denying it and saying, no, it was going to be a little small time fad. It was going to come and go. And we just knew we were onto something big. And this was where our hearts were. This was like our church. What was it that attracted Steve Jobs here? Uh, Steve, well, me. I was coming here. I was the one who came here, and I brought Steve in after a while. I started talking about what was going on and what the possibilities were for microprocessors. And Steve would say, oh, could you put a floppy disk on it? Could you put a disk drive on it? And I said, yes, you could someday, but I don't know how to do that. And so he was really asking you all these questions. He was, I thought he was, he was way out into a, an area of where computers would be worth money, and I was just at the area of where can you build a first computer, a minimal one. So it sounds as if he but was But he thinking... came by. He, he came by, and he would listen to it, and he saw that a whole bunch of people would gather around me interested in my design and that's where he came up with the idea why don't we sell something <laughs> Steve persuaded Wozniak to start production in Jobs's garage on a computer they called the Apple one Steve recognized you know that we have something that's so much a step in the right direction the Apple one was the first computer ever to be shipped low-cost computer with a keyboard a human keyboard that you could read the letters of the alphabet and type before that, they were just switches and lights, and they looked like an airplane cockpit, and they belong in some commercial factory floor, and all these other little hobby computers look that way. Steve is using his powers to influence, and he's taking charge, too. While the Apple I was slowly selling a few dozen models, Bill Gates had gone to Harvard University, only to drop out to set up Microsoft with school friend Paul Allen. Instead of making hardware like the folks at Homebrew, Gates was writing software to go into these new computers, catching the wave of the newly emerging computer chip market. He was running a several million dollar a year business, uh, was extraordinarily aggressive, and his goal was to uh, control uh, languages for small computers, uh, I think from day one. Gates was ambitious, confident, and determined. Microsoft would write code for every new chip that came out without knowing whether it would be successful. Everybody else seemed to want to wait around until a machine was uh, in production and it sold a few thousand units before they put their investment into writing code for it. Gates was a dominant personality, accumulating power in the software market while barely in his 20s. 
he definitely knew uh, what it was he wanted to do, and uh, he he helped shape the company. I think I think a lot of people at the time uh, had the same. They shared that vision that the uh, personal computer was going to be a very big thing to the world. How big? I'm not sure. We all knew at the time, but we knew it was going to be important. So, what do these events from their early lives tell us about how well equipped Gates and Jobs were to become the world's most powerful computer moguls? They both had incredible vision. They could see what computers could become. They were good at persuading others to work toward their vision, and they were great at deal making. So, who's ahead at this point? Both Gates and Jobs are bosses before the age of 20. Gates, however, is the more powerful, running the bigger company. But what does it take to move into the international arena? I got the impression from Waz that Steve Jobs hounded him. Wait until you hear how he got Waz to leave his job at Hewlett Packard and join Apple full time. I told Steve Jobs no. And that I wouldn't do it. And Steve went to friends and got my relatives to call me. And they thought, if somebody's putting in this big money, you should do it. And it was tough, but my friend really spoke the right words to me, and um, I saw it for the right reasons. And I left Hewlett Packard that day. Steve called your par your relatives and had your relatives call you. I like of course. That. Well, he should. You know what? In any company, if you really want somebody, or you want some resource, or a product, or a chip. You should go out and pursue every avenue you can, and do a lot of work to get it. If it's important, if you want to hire somebody and they're good, you should go out of your way and take extreme measures to try to get that person. He, you know, he's just ruthless in pursuit of what you know. Once he gets a vision about what should happen, he's just ruthless, and that's a great thing. After the Apple One came the Apple Two, and the Apple Two again was. Wozniak just charging forward and making the prototype. Steve Jobs clung to Woz. He could see that Woz's little computer would make him rich. Our sales just shot sky high, and sales started going up to 100. First company ever to sell 100,000 computers, to sell a million computers. In the early days, Apple was, you know, if anything, more the result of Woz's brain than Steve. I mean, St Steve took Woz's prototypes and made it into a. Commercial product with a plastic case that a consumer could buy. Was why did you need Steve Jobs to make the Apple II? You need kind of a striving force and a vision that takes sees a product going to people and how they're going to use it and, and being able to um, develop. He wanted a company. He wanted it to be successful. Everything it takes: phone calls and talking to people, finding out what else is going on, getting ads made, all the all the work that it takes to really just. Have a company that has a meaning and a vision. When Jobs took Apple public, a mere five years after its start in his garage, he was worth in excess of one hundred million dollars at only twenty-five years of age. Steve Jobs was catapulted into power as the founder of a company that led a revolution. But what about Bill Gates? I'm on my way to discover how IBM helped make Gates one of the most powerful men in computing. When IBM realized they needed their own PC to compete with Apple, they went to see Bill Gates. I'm going to talk to the IBM executive who handed Bill Gates what proved to be a license to print money. One Sunday morning, Jack Sams was called to a top-level meeting to discuss how IBM would develop their own personal computer from scratch. The message was clear: IBM had no time to lose. The chairman of the corporation had said, "I want a machine that will capture the hearts and minds of the young people in the United States. Uh, Apple is going to beat us to it if we don't get on our horse and get going." So. Our division president stood up and told our lab he had to ship a machine that was in the Apple II price class.、Uh, it had to be an IBM machine, couldn't be somebody else's machine,、uh, and it had to be done in a year. The company Jack Sams chose for his software was Microsoft. His bosses doubted that Gates could deliver at this level, so Sams paid Gates a visit. Bill Gates' age was. 23, but it didn't make any difference. After 15 or 20 minutes with Bill Gates, I was quite convinced that he was a better programmer than I was. 
and he was probably a better engineer than the fellow I was that I had with me and I suspect he was a better lawyer than the lawyer I had with me uh, he was a very impressive fellow impressive maybe but Bill Gates didn't have an operating system that would work that week he found some software he could adapt he bought it for just fifty thousand dollars and then licensed it to IBM he called it MS-DOS Bill was canny enough to decide that rather than making a, a one-time charge for his products, and it wasn't just the operating system, it was also his languages, that he would uh, offer us a, uh, a per copy, very small per copy charge, a royalty arrangement, rather than uh, a single charge arrangement. The deal netted Gates billions, not least because it allowed him to license the same software to the millions of other PCs that were appearing on the market. Gates's instincts were right, that personal computing would explode, a belief that was the key to his power. It uh, may have been the best business deal that's been struck in, in our country, at least, uh, in this century. So who's in the lead at this stage? Bill Gates is emerging as a brilliant business strategist, while Steve Jobs is proving to be the industry's number one creative visionary. Jobs created the PC revolution, without which IBM would not have come knocking at Gates' door. So for me, it's got to be Jobs who is ahead. I know I'd go from rags to riches if you would only say me Fame increases power. So what was it about our two contenders that took them from roles within the computer industry to the larger public stage to become people we all know and recognize? Steve Jobs' moment of fame came when he created the revolutionary Apple Macintosh. Today we celebrate the first glorious anniversary. Jobs launched the Macintosh in 1984. The advertisement underlined his counterculture credentials and his dislike for the gray suits at IBM, whose PCs were outselling Apple's. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. The Macintosh launch was a media frenzy. Press attended from over 80 countries. It was one of Jobs' legendary stage performances. Today, we are introducing the third industry milestone product, Macintosh. The Macintosh blew people's minds. Um, first of all, it had a mouse, it had icons, it had little windows that when it booted up, there was a little smiley face. An industry that had previously had sort of command lines and you would type things and you'd have to sort of have a list of codes along the side of your monitor. Um, by, by sort of saying, this isn't the enemy anymore. This isn't sort of an unfriendly work machine. This is something you can actually love. It was all down to one man. So it is with considerable pride that I introduce a man who's been like a father to me, Steve Jobs. The Macintosh brought Jobs a cult following. It was truly Jobs' moment of fame. But what about Bill? When did he become really famous? It was in 1995 when he became the world's richest man. At that time, his fortune was estimated to be $40 billion. Wow. I'm going to Seattle to meet a man who Bill Gates made a multimillionaire. Marlon Eller joined Microsoft in 1982. I'm hoping he'll explain to me what it takes to become the world's richest man. 
I actually think one of the neatest things was that uh, I'm one of the few people that knew who Bill Gates was before he became, you know, the richest man in the world. I knew him when he was just the guy across the way in the, uh, in the office. What was Bill like in those days? The fact that he understood what you could do and couldn't do with software meant that his demands were, they were never impossible demands from someone that just didn't know, but he always was pushing for, can you clear this bar, can you clear this bar, is this really the best I can get? And I think that was, uh, uh, was just the motivation that attracted a lot of the technical guys, the guys who wanted to prove I'm the smartest programmer out there, and he's saying, oh, are you really? You know, can it do this, can it do this? And he was always probing for a little bit more, and I think, I think the mixture was just wonderful. He sounds as if he was excited by the technology, but also a practical businessman. Is that accurate? That, I, I would say that's very accurate. Bill understood the technology. He'd get excited about it, and then he would do the switcheroo on the business. And how many of those, it's going to take you two years to build that, and how many units will we sell, and what will it cost to produce it? So I, I saw that as his focus was very much on the business side of things. Gates built on his fortune from DOS, selling 100 million copies of its replacement, Windows. Gates shaped Microsoft, but the company also molded him. The world likes to believe in heroes, and so if we can make him into the Calvin Klein, that was actually one of the things that was described, we can make him the Calvin Klein of the software world, people want to believe that this one guy is out there doing it all. So they, they pushed for a while in that direction to make Bill into the, he's the guy who runs everything, he's the guy who writes all the software, and uh, of course that wasn't really true. I mean, there were other people that wrote the software. Yes, he was the CEO, yes, he made final decisions, but in many ways ideas propagated up from from, uh, from below, and he would he'd give the, the yay or nay on the ideas rather than all the ideas came out of Bill. Gates's personal wealth is extraordinary, over $40 billion. He has given his charitable foundation over $20 billion. It is now worth more than Apple Computer. I think that Microsoft has created more millionaires than any other company in the history of the United States. You were one of the beneficiaries of that. Uh, yeah, I was one of the Microsoft millionaires. There are, there are a lot of us. It's almost like you all are the children of Bill Gates. <laughs> it's true. I had, I had one, uh, one friend who told me, oh, yeah, someday, you know, they'll talk about your kids. Oh, yeah, he's old money. He's Microsoft money. And Marlon, I bought some of those shares. It was one of my best investments ever. Money made Bill famous, so much so that he is way ahead in the fame stakes. Both contenders do gain power from their public profiles. It's part of their company branding, and that helps sell products. But how do they fare when things go wrong? So much for the good times, but what about the bad? Both of our contenders had to show their power to survive when things went badly wrong. Bill Gates' moment of shame came just four years ago in a courtroom in Washington, D.C. Judge Thomas Penfield Jackson was looking at whether or not Microsoft was an illegal monopoly which should be broken apart. It was the most important legal case in Microsoft's history but Bill Gates' videotape deposition proved an unmitigated disaster. The man who conducted the deposition is David Boyce, lead prosecutor in the trial and one of America's most celebrated lawyers. There were times when he was direct. Um, there were other times when he was evasive. I've never seen are. a stamp like that. I've never used a stamp like that. Haven't you seen stamps like that in every single one of the documents that you've been shown during this deposition? Can you get, get me all the exhibits? It's just a waste of time. It is a waste of time. There were times, as you know, when he would say that he didn't understand what certain words meant that a lot of people think most English speakers would understand. I have no idea what you're talking about when you say ask. So there were a number of different aspects of the deposition that I think gave him trouble when the deposition was played later. 
The case concerned Microsoft's actions toward a company called Netscape who had invented the internet browser. By the mid-90s, most people were using it. Then Microsoft stepped in. Microsoft released Internet Explorer, which is their version of the browser. Um, it, was, it was technically um, e equivalent and it was free. Microsoft, with billions in cash reserves, could afford to give its browser away for free, thus ruining the market for Netscape. Making it free was, was certainly important in that it certainly deprived other companies of possible revenues they might get um, from the browser. So it sort of took a lot of the air out of the, uh, out of, out of the market. Microsoft was accused in court of abusing its power by telling manufacturers they couldn't have Microsoft software unless they also installed its browser. Um, when you buy a computer, there the browser was. There wasn't a strong, especially since the browser was perfectly good, there wasn't a strong incentive to switch to another one. Seven years later, um, Netscape uh, browser is virtually gone. Could this type of corporate behavior be tied to Bill Gates personally? There were a number of instances in which even though he denied knowledge, the paper trail, the emails that existed, demonstrated that he was involved in one way or another. Microsoft lost the case. The result will be an exciting and innovative set of new products with more choices and lower prices for America's consumers. Judge Jackson ruled that Microsoft broke antitrust laws on three counts including the illegal bullying of its competitors in its attempt to dominate the internet browser market. This was a devastating judgment for Microsoft. Today's ruling really represents an unwarranted and unjustified intrusion into the software marketplace, a marketplace that has been an engine of economic growth for America. We will be exercising our right to appeal this decision, and we're confident the judicial system will overturn today's ruling. With the courts proposing to split Microsoft in two, Gates's holdings in the company slumped by $30 billion. Steve Jobs also experienced a devastating setback. I'm outside of the offices of someone who in the 1980s was one of America's most powerful businessmen. He was a close associate, employed by Jobs himself to set the company on the right track. But he became a significant factor in Jobs' downfall. It was Jobs' greatest moment of shame. And I'm off to meet the man who was there when it happened. How did you come to work for Apple? I wasn't looking for a job. I was the CEO of Pepsi-Cola back in the early 1980s. And I was approached by the headhunter, Jerry Roach, uh, who said that he wanted me to meet uh, two extraordinary guys out on the West Coast who were helping to build this new industry called personal computers, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. We had been looking for a CEO, top-level CEO, uh, worldwide. and. John Scully was one of the ones that some of our search firms had encountered. He was described as being unavailable. Steve Jobs heard that, and basically, nothing's unavailable, and that's really how you should think. After months of trying to persuade Scully to leave Pepsi and join him, Jobs made one last pitch. He looked up at me with these very penetrating eyes. He said, do you really want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life, or do you want to come with me and change the world? And uh, it was only a matter of a few weeks later that I found myself at Apple Computer as the new CEO. What was your relationship like when you started to work together? We had an incredible relationship. <clears throat> uh, Steve and I could finish each other's sentences. Uh, he uh, was clearly the visionary and the founder, and I looked up to him with real respect. After a year of working together, Macintosh sales plummeted. The relationship started to chill. Steve became very discouraged and he went into uh, a real de funk, a depression over it all. And uh, he and I started having real disagreements on uh, just basic operational decisions. They could not work out their differences, so John Scully went to the board of Apple. The board interviewed each of us and the board decided that uh, you know, I should be the one to run the company and that's when Steve left. 
So within two years of appointing John Scully as CEO, Steve was removed from the company he founded. Gates' power was threatened by the courts, but Jobs lost more when he was ousted from Apple. But neither of these men is the type to be kept down for long. So what are Gates and Microsoft up to now? Although Bill was unable to overturn the guilty verdict, by now he had enough money and power to negotiate a deal. He was helped by the election of a sympathetic entrepreneur as U.S. president. It leaves the Microsoft monopoly intact. Is there any business this company won't go into? I'm off to meet Microsoft's head of research to find out. What is the focus of Microsoft's research today, and what other product areas are you going into? The way I like to think about Microsoft is we're a computer science company. We're, we're involved in the things that computers do. And so over time, as, as computers have moved into new areas, we have moved with computing. Increasingly, Microsoft software shows up in all sorts of devices, whether it be network routers or set-top boxes for cable TV systems. Uh, obviously, we, we introduced the Xbox game console a few years ago, so we've gotten into sort of the entertainment business. We develop hardware products like the Microsoft mouse. We now sell a wireless network device. Really, it, almost anything that you can think of attached to computing, it seems like we're, we, we tend to get involved in. What has been his impact on the lives of ordinary people? In, in many of the things that people use, you know, whether you know, personal computers, um, you know, computing devices that they may use in their, in their everyday lives, you know, y you could say there's a little piece of, of Bill there, right? And something in his, you know, part of his intellect has helped to shape, you know, the, the tools and the things that people are using. But not everyone believes that's such a great thing. I've been challenged to a game of chess by someone who thinks Microsoft's expansion is a very bad thing indeed. Ed Black lobbies four Microsoft's competitors who feel Gates uses his power to crush them, denying the consumer choice. It's your move. I've made mine. What's your move? Well, if I'm Bill Gates, I'm not going to worry about the rules, and I'm going to do that. <laughs> but that's not legal. If you don't make me take it back, if you let me get away with it, guess what? That's what I'm going to do. And that's what he has done. And I think that's what he has done. And unfortunately, the government is not making him put it back and restore competition. So what do you want to happen? We just want to make sure there's a level playing field that everybody who is creative and works hard has a good shot. But Ed, if I wanted to launch a new product and you were Microsoft, could I succeed? Only in the areas I'm not paying attention to. If I'm focusing on this, I have this monopoly and this monopoly and this monopoly to surround you and cut off your choices and to box in and stop somebody else and their ability to move. And perhaps, if nobody's looking, to do some illegal things to you. This is not war. It's civilized capitalism. Business is not war. I'm going to have my Microsoft moment. I'm going to take your king, and I'm going to leave you out here. Well, if you had a Microsoft moment, I'm afraid you might be tempted to hit me over the head with that. <laughs> <laughs> What's significant is just how many big companies Ed Black represents. Multinationals like Time Warner, Nokia, Kodak, and Oracle, all worried by the Microsoft monopoly. Weighing up the critics' views and considering Gates' expansion plans, he's got to be a global contender. But what about Steve Jobs? Is he also a fighter? Excuse me. Oh, impressive wingspan. These are plastic. He can't fly. Out on his ear, Jobs showed his resilience after losing power at Apple. He invested in a computer animation business called Pixar. Plays. <clears throat> Watch yourself. Boom. Boss, who goes there? Don't shoot. It's okay. Friends. Do you know these life forms? Yes. Pixar is, uh, is, is a new sort of movie studio. Um, they make exclusively computer-generated films. Um, the most recent one is Finding Nemo. Uh, before that, there were the Toy Story films, um, uh, Bugs Life, and, and, and others. 
Pixar films have grossed over $2 billion, with the film Finding Nemo the biggest box office hit in animation history. When Pixar went public in 1997, it made Steve a billionaire. So that was really kind of his recognition that the technology, again, is the classic Steve Jobs, that the technology was ready and that people would want it. Jobs' return to power was crowned when, in 1997, after a decade away, he was asked back to Apple as its CEO. How great a fight back was that? Jobs' innovations turned the company around. Since his return, Apple's value has skyrocketed. Nobody would have been at all surprised if Apple went out of business in the mid-90s. In fact, you could have bet money on it. So actually, the Apple that we see today rose from the ashes based on Steve coming back. These were recognition from a single person of, of both what was possible, what technology enabled, and what people wanted. It's a very kind of intuitive sense of, uh, of where the world should be going, and he has the power to make it happen. Hello. Jobs is the most successful innovator in computing today, with his leadership at Apple and his pioneering at Pixar. He's at the cutting edge in both Silicon Valley and Hollywood. Woody, I wonder, could he be the most powerful computer mogul in the world? So now that I'm nearing the end of my journey, I have to choose between my two contenders. I've heard how they both changed the world, how Bill Gates' software has revolutionized the workplace, and how his influence now extends into every aspect of our lives. The great thing about software is that it's very, it's relatively cheap to make, and if it goes to everybody, a lot of money comes in, and that's how you become the richest man in the world. I've heard how Steve Jobs is the visionary who's revolutionized computer design. Steve Jobs will be remembered as he is today as the key person to making modern computers the way we see them today. Formidable personalities who, despite setbacks, have come out on top again and again. Steve Jobs, he's the right brain of the industry. Gates is the left brain of the industry. It's going to be hard deciding which one is the world's most powerful. So what have I learned about power in the computer industry? It involves talent and the innate drive to create and then continually improve a product that will change the way you and I think. But you know what? Even that's not enough. Equally important is being in the right place at the right time. So who's the most powerful, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates? Well, I will agree with anyone that Steve Jobs and Apple create products that are beautiful, elegant to use. But Bill Gates' software is everywhere. It's throughout our daily lives, therefore extending his power. My choice as the world's most powerful computer mogul is Bill Gates. So that was my decision. Let me know what you think by visiting www.bbc.co.uk forward slash world's most powerful. Next week, I'll be deciding whether David Beckham or Tiger Woods is the world's most powerful sportsman. I'm on the trail of those few people who shape our lives to discover the true nature of modern power and influence. Tonight, I'm investigating the world of computing. I've chosen two giants of the computing world. They were both born in the same year, 1955. I've chosen Steve Jobs, who gave us the PC, and Bill Gates, whose software runs on millions of computers around the world. They are the founders and leaders of companies whose logos we all recognize, Microsoft and Apple. Businesses whose combined value is over $290 billion. Their influence is global and affects every aspect of our daily lives. 
The best thing is at the end of the program, I get to decide which one of them is the world's most powerful person in computing. did these two men get their power from? And when did it become clear to those around them that they were set for greatness? I'm off to the west coast of the U.S. to find out. Here in the mountains above Silicon Valley, I've come to meet Dan Kotke, one of Steve Jobs' best friends in college, to go back to those forgotten days before the personal computer. I first met Steve my first month of uh, college as a freshman at Reed College. Did you become instant friends? Um, not quite. We uh, bonded over our mutual interest in Eastern literature and philosophy. There was Be Here Now, Autobiography of a Yogi, Cosmic Consciousness by Buck, you know, Ramakrishna. I read books. Yeah. Was Steve into that too at the oh, time? Oh yeah, very much so. Steve and I used to hitchhike to the Hare Krishna temple on Sunday nights for the love feast. No. Yeah. Did he have long hair and all that sort of uh, stuff? Oh, yeah, everybody had long hair. Yes, for the love and, feast. Yeah. Amazing. And well, what well, the main attraction was it was free. <laughs> <laughs> at age 15, Bill and a friend set up a company called Trafodata, charging companies to analyze traffic information. They took the tapes that come from those little rubber tubes that do the traffic uh, counts and they analyzed those for, the, for these different companies that were doing traffic studies. This is amazing. And there were students doing this. Yes, they were doing it. They were very capable. But this, this indicates a strong entrepreneurial spirit even when they were young. Yeah, and I think, I think you could tell Bill was going to be a good businessman when they started working on contract issues, and if they had any little disputes with the company, they, they would really hammer it out and make sure that it, it worked right. As far as the early days are concerned, Bill Gates is off to a great start. He is already writing software in school and showing the entrepreneurial flair that will score big for him later in life. For me, Bill is ahead at this stage. But let's see what happens when these two really get on the road to power. This is one of Steve Jobs' oldest friends, nicknamed Waz. I'm hoping Waz can reveal how a directionless hippie like Steve Jobs kick-started the computer revolution. What about Bill? Did he show early signs of the ability and attitude to get ahead? 400 miles away at Lakeside, a private school in Seattle, I might discover more. I'm off to meet Bill Gates' math teacher to see if he recognized any of the traits that marked Bill for such phenomenal achievement. As his teacher, what were the three personality traits that you observed in Bill Gates that are reflected in his current success? Well, I think the first was his incredible curiosity. He was really curious about anything to do with computers. The second would be his tenacity in trying to solve a problem or figure out how to work through a problem. And I guess the, the third would be his just desire to be intellectually on top of whatever it was that he was working with and really put it in perspective. What kind of student was he? As a computer student, he always found the quickest ways to write a little program that would work or do this or do that or the other thing. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, uh, we would go, the teachers would go to Bill and his cohorts to learn things if we didn't understand how to do them ourselves. <laughs> I love that. The teachers would go to the student to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Steve had not yet found his passion. Instead, he dropped out of university and with Dan, traveled around India for six months. What were the personal characteristics that made you think he would end up where he is today? Uh, I didn't. I didn't think that. I don't know. I don't think anybody could have. The Steve that I knew when we were in India 
I, I did not see that ambition at all. But what you can say for sure is that Steve is uh, an independent thinker. He was always looking for people who were unconventional and free thinkers like himself. A very early trick that Steve used to use was just, you know, putting his bare feet up on the conference table when he was interviewing people just to see what, how they would react. Did Steve change once he began to make tens of millions of dollars? No, what changed Steve was the, uh, the vision and the zeal of changing the world with computers, and that's a good thing. You know, Steve is actually remarkably unaffected by his wealth, I would say. According to Dan, Steve was a pretty cosmic guy, and still is. But his potential to be the most powerful computer mogul was far from obvious. 